Camels are one example of an animal that is really well adapted to their environment. So they have humps which are made of fat but they are used to store water but they are not full of water, they're full of fat. Um, they have long eyelashes. That is for keeping the sand out of their eyes. Um, they have wide toes. So that is that so they don't um, sink into the ground. Um, they are really, really well adapted. Um, and they are a nice sandy brown colour so they match in with the sand. Cacti are an example of plants that are well adapted to a desert environment. So they have spines instead of leaves. This is to reduce surface area and to prevent them being um, eaten. They have thick stems. Um, this is for water storage and they have a shallow but wide um, set of roots so that they can um, absorb water as soon as it hits the surface over a very, very wide area. Polar bears are an example of an animal that is well adapted to an arctic environment. So they have small ears, um, which means their surface area is actually very, very small compared to the volume. So it means they're going to um, reduce heat loss. They are well insulated, which I'm afraid is just a rather nice way of saying they're quite fat. They have um, a very, very thick layer of um, blubber or fat all around them, which keeps them warm and is they can use it as an energy source when they struggle to find fur. They have thick coats. That is going to trap the air in and keep them warm. And they have white coats. They have black skin, but they have white coats. Um, and this avoids helps them to be camouflaged in the snow, which means they can avoid predators. A population that is living in the wild can be affected by a range of different things. This could be a new disease that's been introduced, wiping out um, a large number of the population. It could be a new predator that's been introduced or a predator that is thriving for some reason in this year. It could be due to an oversupply or undersupply of food. It could be due to competitors. So if um, a new species is introduced that eats the same food, then that could affect it. It could be due to the temperature, so if it has a nice thick woolly coat and it gets really, really hot, well, it's not going to do very well. Or it could get very cold. It could rain too much or too little, or there could be too much water or air pollution for a population to survive. Um, our world is a very, very delicate thing where everything lives in balance. And... Um, if things tip out of balance, even slightly, even by one degree, it's going to have a massive, massive effect on the animals and plants that live here. As the population of the world increases, so does the amount of food that we need to eat. And this is where one of the arguments for being a vegetarian comes in. Because we have the sun our lovely green sun here and this is providing energy to things now the energy will go into the plants and if we eat that straight away there isn't going to be a massive amount of energy lost whereas if the cows eat the plants and then we eat the cows Um, you're actually going to get more energy loss. So it's not a very efficient way of doing it. So there is an excellent, well, several excellent, excellent videos about how becoming a vegetarian can actually save the planet. Photosynthesis is the method that plants use to make food. They take in carbon dioxide... And water and convert it into glucose and oxygen. Now for this to happen they need light. Now the reason we write it above the um, arrow like that is because we need it to happen but it's not actually a reactant so it doesn't get used up in the equation. Now there are several different things that um, a plant needs to 
photosynthesis to take place and we can call these limiting factors. So the limiting factors for photosynthesis are going to be light. So if we don't have light, we're not going to get a lot of photosynthesis, so at night. Um, the reactants, for example, if we don't have any carbon dioxide or any water, then we are not going to get photosynthesis taking place. And the other thing is also going to be temperature. When we talk about pyramids in biology, we are talking about either pyramids of biomass or pyramids of numbers. And these are stepped pyramids, not um, triangular pyramids like you might be used to. And each level, um, there's another level in there, each level is going to represent an animal or an organism in a food chain. So right down at the bottom here, we could have, say, a 100 weeds. These weeds get fed upon by nine rabbits. Those rabbits get fed upon by one fox. And then for this one, the rest of the pyramid doesn't exist. Now, pyramids don't always look like pyramids. For example, in this, um, the ra weeds, rabbit, fox that I've drawn here, we could have um, something else feeding on the fox. Um, now, this could be a large thing feeding on the fox, or it could be a small thing feeding on the fox. If it was a small thing feeding on the fox, if we're doing a pyramid of numbers, and say this was a thousand fleas, it wouldn't look very pyramid shaped because the bit at the top would be very, very large. Um, sometimes they look like pyramids, sometimes they don't look like pyramids. You just have to um, use your common sense in an exam. Now, sometimes they might have little blocks drawn on and you might just have to count up how many blocks it takes up um, so that you can work out how many things go in that level. So for the carbon cycle, I'm referring a lot to organic compounds. And if you haven't heard this phrase before, it can be a bit confusing. Organic compounds are just any compound that has carbon in it. And just to remind you, a compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. So here are all the different locations that carbon can be. It can be carbon dioxide in the air, or carbon dioxide can be dissolved in oceans. It can be as organic compounds in plants or in animals. These organic compounds can also be present in the dead plants and animals, and they are in fossil fuels. Now you need to know the various different ways that they change um, um, from all these different locations and what the processes are called. So let's start with fossil fuels. When we have fossil fuels, we can burn them so that the carbon in them goes into the air. And the fancy name for this is combustion. When the carbon dioxide is in the air, it can be taken up by plants. And this is a process of photosynthesis. And the opposite can occur as well, because plants will also undergo respiration. Plants get eaten by animals. And then plants and animals both die. From the um, organic compounds that are in the dead um, plants and animals, they can turn into fossil fuels by either either being buried or being sedimented, or they can just go straight back up into the air 
affected by the process of decay. And then lastly, our animals are also undergoing respiration. So carbon isn't a static thing. It is constantly moving around from carbon dioxide in the air to carbon compounds that are in animals, plants, in dead animals, and then being inserted into fossil fuels, which can then be burnt and put the carbon dioxide back in the air. This is a very, very complicated, involved process that happens over millions of years, and you need to know all of these steps. We are actually very, very complicated beings. So here we have a cell. Inside our cell, we have our nucleus. Inside our nucleus, we have chromosomes. Let me put that arrow there. Inside the chromosomes, we have all of this coiled up DNA. And the DNA is made of two strands. So this is our double helix, our DNA. And DNA is made up of, as we can see here, bases which are A, T, C and G. And the, the structure of this, the sentence that it spells, we can then go from DNA. DNA has sections in it, which are gene. You can think of that as like um, a word or a sentence in a book. And then the sections of DNA will code for a protein. And the proteins are the building blocks of everything. Everyone's DNA is unique and we can use that for a couple of things and this is what we call DNA fingerprinting. We can use it for paternity tests. Or we can use it for forensics. So um, if there's blood or something left at a crime scene, we can work out whose it comes from. Now meiosis is something different. This happens in sexual reproduction. So it's going to happen in our gametes. This is going to be our sperm or our egg cells. And what we end up with is four different haploid cells. Haploid means it has half the amount of DNA. So it is going to have 23 chromosomes, not the 46 chromosomes or the 23 pairs that you would normally see in um, a skin cell, for example. Now, my use is you're only going to get one set of chromosomes, you're going to get four new cells, and remember this happens in your reproductive organs only. I have a really stupid, silly way of remembering the difference between myosis and mitosis, and I've made a separate video explaining that for you. The chromosomes that determine whether we are male or female are our sex chromosomes. So, a woman will have XX chromosomes and man will have XY chromosomes. Now all eggs are going to be X chromosomes. And then the sperm is going to be the bit that decides whether you're male or female because they're going to be 50% X and 50% Y. Stem cells are fantastic little things, and the really interesting, amazing thing about them is they have the potential to differentiate into anything.
This means they can be really, really useful in curing diseases because we can take <coughs> cells that can be specific to the person and turn them into any type of cells that we want. So it could be um, nerve cells to replace people who are paralysed by spinal damage. Um, we can replace cells um, in tissue, um, so for example, that people that have heart disease, or it can be used in cancer treatment. But there are some ethical issues around this, so this might be one of the questions they might ask you in the exams. There are strict, strict guidelines um, surrounding the use of stem cells, partly because some of them come from embryos and partly because some people don't think this sort of um, research, this sort of treatment should be taking place because of religious reasons. Now there are a couple of different ways that you can draw a genetic cross. I prefer doing what is called the Punnett square. So here we have an RR and an RR person. The first thing we need to do is to work out the gametes. So we are going to have an R and an R and an R and an R. I do understand me saying R and R and R and R very lot. Um, isn't necessarily the clearest thing if we're not actually watching the video for this. Then you need to draw out a grid. like this and then put your gametes in the top so r r r r and then fill in things so this column here going across we're going to have all r's so r r and then the lower one here is all going to be lowercase r's so r r and then going down here we need capital r's so r r and then going down here, we need lowercase r's, so r, r. Now what we have is r, 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 r in the ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. Cystic fibrosis is a disease where the cell membranes are disrupted. which leads to a large number of different um, phenotypes. So lots and lots of things that um, are a problem for people with cystic fibrosis. The most common one that people know about is a problem that people have with breathing. Now, cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. Which means two people can have the um, gene for cystic fibrosis and have absolutely no symptoms at all. And the way, if we just want to draw the Punnett square that this works, is we have the gene for cystic fibrosis, which is a capital F. And then this one here is going to be the disease gene. So our gametes are capital F, lowercase f, capital F, lowercase f, and these are our parents. If we just draw out our Punnett square, capital F, lowercase f, capital F, lowercase f. Now, if you, like me, your f's look very, very similar, you won't want to consider in the, in the exam just drawing... Um, making it very, very clear to the examiner that you can do, so we make it abundantly clear that this is a capital F and that this is a lowercase f or something else. Because if the examiner's not sure, they're not going to be able to give you the marks. So if we just fill this out. And then this person here who has two recessive genes is going to be a sufferer. This person here is going to be um, normal, and these two people over here are carriers. So we can say if you want to um, do it um, to the normal two sufferers, we are going to have a three to one ratio. People with polydactyly are going to have extra fingers or toes. And this is a dominant gene. So the capital D is going to be um, the person that is going to have polydactyly. 
and then lowercase d is going to be for the normal gene. So if we have one parent that has um, polydactyly, capital D, lowercase, 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 um, and they make a baby with somebody who doesn't have polydactyly, here's our Punnett square, lowercase, lowercase, capital, capital, D, 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 D. We are going to get two people that have polydactyly and two people that do not have polydactyly. And this is going to be in a one to one ratio. There are a large number of new crop types, genetically modified or GM crops, that are being tested at the moment. The advantages for GM crops is that they could have an increased yield, so they could make more wheat or more um, apples per tree or whatever they're testing, um, which means there's going to be more food around, which in a time where people go to bed hungry and there are people starving, Probably people on your street, probably people, definitely people in your town who go to bed hungry. Um, being able to make more food cheaply is a good thing. Um, it also has lots of really, really positive implications for developing countries. They can um, engineer rice, which is a staple food in lots of countries, really easy to grow, so that it doesn't need as much water, so it becomes drought resistant, so that and the communities are going to be less vulnerable to having a bad or a season or a season where it doesn't rain very much. They can also engineer um, these crops to have certain nutrients or vitamins in them. So if it has a high level of vitamin A, for example, that means these people um, that are growing and eating these crops are going to be healthier because of the crops they're eating. Um, they can also have herbicides in or insecticides in so that um, they don't get eaten by um, insects or there's less competition from other plants. The downside to this is that some people don't think they're very safe and are scared of them so they don't like them. Variation in a population occurs for two reasons. We can have genetic variation and we can have environmental variation. Now, even if we have identical twins, they are not going to be identical. This is all due to environmental variation. Um, they can have slight differences in how they look, how they behave, they can have different hair, they can have different weights, they can be different heights. Even if you have the same um, set of parents, if you have a big litter of tiny kittens, they are going to show genetic variation and environmental variation. Genetic variation is going to be things like um, fur colour, hair colour, eye colour, it's going to be down to um, height, um, it's going to be down to um, whether you have freckles or whether you don't have freckles, um, things like that. Environmental variation is going to depend on a lot of factors. So not only um, how you were raised, but the environment that you were raised in. For example, um, the availability of food when you were growing up, um, your school life and um, your health. So whether you're exposed to certain diseases or whether you had any immunizations. In sexual reproduction, we have gametes. These are the sperm and the egg. So here are our little sperm, here's our egg. This picture is not to scale, by the way. Um, so here's our sperm, sperm and egg, and they fuse together to make the fertilised egg. Then that is going to divide by mitosis, which means you're going to get two cells which are going to be identical. Asexual reproduction is where a plant or an animal produces an identical version of itself. So you can see this happening really commonly in um, strawberries when they send out runners and new plants are produced. We are going to get identical daughters and this again happens by 
mitosis. Now there are a few problems with asexual reproduction because there's only one parent you're going to end up with a lot of clones and if this plant or this animal is susceptible to diseases and a disease strikes and your entire plant population are clones of each other then the whole population is going to be wiped out. Farmers can deliberately engineer cloning, um, they can take cuttings of plants and grow them, or it happens quite a lot in cows. So if you have a prize cow and a prize um, bull, they can take the eggs out of one cow and fertilise a large number of eggs from um, the cow that they want. They can then make it uh, wait until it gets to embryo stage, so when we have several cells all growing in a clump and then they can split that up and then each cell can go into a different mother. So this would be cow number one, this would be cow number two and this would be cow number three. And you can have potentially eight, um, ten maybe identical eggs or identical embryos sorry that are being put back into 10 different surrogate mothers and then you're going to have a large number of identical calves being born. Now the advantage of this for the farmer is that um, it increases the chance of getting um, good offspring being born so like if you're talking about good milk production or good meat production but the disadvantages are your reducing and um, variation in your population. So if a disease strikes, that are likely that they're all going to be affected. Charles Darwin came up with the idea of evolution. This is the theory of natural selection. The theory goes that occasionally in um, uh, when, when someone's or an animal's making babies, there's going to be a mutation. And this mutation could have no effect, it could have a good effect, or it could have a bad effect. And every so often, there's going to be a mutation that's going to be good for the offspring. Now, this could be changing the colour of a rabbit's fur, it could be increasing or decreasing the size of the ears, it could be making a giraffe's neck longer. But this random mutation that happens means that the offspring is more likely to survive because it is better suited to the environment. Whether it's better suited because it's better camouflaged, because it can survive temperatures better, or whether it has better access to food, there are lots of different reasons why, but it is going to be better suited to the environment. And these mutations occur completely randomly. There is another theory to evolution, um, by Lamarck um, and his theory was that acquired characteristics during an, um, a person or an animal's life, lifespan can be passed on to the offspring. For example, if you dye your hair blonde, that means you can then pass that characteristic on to your offspring. Obviously, we now know that that is rubbish because dyeing your hair blonde doesn't change the fact that you might have brown hair genes. Drugs come in a large variety of formats. The main types are going to be painkillers and antibiotics. Now, antibiotic resistance um, occurs very, very frequently and it occurs very, very quickly. All it takes is one tiny little random mutation in one bacteria in one part of the world. And this bacteria isn't killed by the antibiotic. And this bacteria, because it survives the antibiotic, can then pass on its resistance and it will very, very quickly spread all over the world. So antibiotic resistance is quite a big problem um, for our time. Um, it's something we need to... to pay quite a lot of attention to really because we need to do as much as we can to stop antibiotic resistance otherwise we're going to go back to a situation where people are dying from routine operations all the time which would be very very bad. Our nervous system allows you to respond to changes in the environment, it allows you to coordinate actions so you can respond to these changes and to be able to respond to a change you need to be able to interpret a change. So a stimulus is going to be picked up by receptors and receptors are all over your body, quite a lot on your face. So we have 
eyes, which are going to go to the light receptors. We have ears, which are going to be sound receptors. Nose, which is going to be um, a sense receptor. We have the tongue, which is a taste receptor. And then we have the skin, which is going to be um, a touch receptor. And all of these receptors will send a signal as part of the nervous system to a receptor cell and cause a response. The signals that are picked up get sent very, very quickly to the central nervous system. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. This is where um, reflexes are going to happen, this is where actions are going to be coordinated. Instructions from the central nervous system are going to be sent back along neurons to effectors, which are going to be things like muscles or glands and are going to cause um, a movements to happen or cause you to have a reflex or cause your glands to secrete a hormone. There are three different types of neurons involved in this. Your sensory neurons that are going to carry the initial signal to the central nervous system. The relay neurons that are going to carry it around from the sensory neurons to the motor neurons. And the motor neurons which are going to carry the signal from the nervous system back to the effectors. Plants will grow towards three things. Light, which is phototrophism, gravity, which is geotrophism or gravitrophism, and they will grow towards water. Now, the way this happens is you get your shoot, and at the top, um, there will be this little hormone called auxin produced. And auxin will cause things to bend towards the light by causing this part, this part um, where the, 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 the hormone's grown, to grow towards it. So it can grow towards light, gravity or water. A hormone is a chemical messenger which will travel around your body via the bloodstream causing an effect. Hormones are going to be very slow to respond. They're going to stay around for in your bloodstream for a very long time. And it's going to be a general response because your blood goes everywhere throughout your body. So one hormone could have more than one effect. Whereas nerves are very, very fast. It could be seconds, the response from a nerve. It's going to be very, very quick. It's going to stay for anywhere around for a short period of time and then it's going to be gone. And it's going to be very, very specific. It's only going to target one um, effector, one set of muscles or something like that. It's incredibly important that we control the amount of glucose in our blood. So after we've eaten um, a meal that contains the carbohydrates, we are going to have an increase in blood glucose levels. When we have that increase in blood glucose levels, the pancreas is going to produce insulin. The insulin is going to cause um, the cells to take up glucose. And the cells in the liver are going to convert that glucose into glucagon. And then when we've made the um, glycogen, what is actually going to happen is going to be stored. And blood glucose is going to fall. Now, some people have problems controlling their blood glucose, and these people are diabetics. There are two different types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes, the pancreas doesn't produce enough or any insulin. So people that have type 1 diabetes need to do a few things 
to control their blood glucose, they need to limit carbohydrates. They need to exercise and they need to monitor their blood glucose. And take insulin as and when they need it. People with type 2 diabetes just need to um, watch what they eat and this is the sort of thing that develops later in life. Now treatments for type 1 diabetes can include um, a pancreas transplant or an artificial pancreas. A balanced and varied diet is essential for staying healthy. This needs to comprise carbohydrates, fats, proteins, especially vitamin C and vitamin D, minerals. You need to have these um, in a balanced and a varied way because they all do different things. You need carbohydrates to provide you with energy and you need fats to provide you with energy as well. Proteins is going to be used for growing and for repair of um, cells, so everyday repair of cells and replacement of cells and um, things that you lose along the way. Vitamins and minerals are going to be um, needed to keep you healthy generally, so you need quite a wide range of these. Um, and like I mentioned before, you get things like vitamin C from fruits, so strawberries, um, oranges, and you get vitamin D from um, dairy products, so like eggs or milk. And these are just important for keeping um, your skin, your blood, your bones and everything really, really healthy. If you don't eat a balanced diet, if you eat too little or too much, if you have an unbalanced diet, this can lead to a variety of different problems. So if you eat too little, you can become malnourished. And if you don't have enough um, vitamins or minerals in your body, this can lead to a number of different diseases. For example, if you don't have um, vitamin C, it can cause scurvy. Now, scurvy is relatively uncommon this day, these days. It used to um, happen a lot when sailors went on boats and they didn't have access to fresh food. But we do have a lot of fresh food. And this can cause problems with your skin, your joints and your um, gums. If you don't have enough iron, which is a mineral in your diet, that can cause anemia which can make you very, very tired or weak. Now, if you eat too much, you can become obese. Um, and this uh, can lead to type 2 diabetes. Now, this is a big, big problem um, in the UK and in other countries as well. Um, because your blood sugar levels go out of control. And this can lead to high blood pressure and heart disease. So it's really important that you have a balanced diet. You need to do exercise as well as having a balanced diet. And the more you exercise, the more you're going to burn as energy, so the more you are likely to eat. Then doing various different forms of exercise is really important for keeping you healthy. There are a large number of different types of drugs that you need to know about. Medicinal drugs, so um, useful things like painkillers or antibiotics. Um, recreational drugs, um, so legal and illegal ones. And performance enhancing drugs, which um, some people use to improve their performance in different sports. And when we're talking about performance enhancing drugs, these can be steroids, which are going to increase the muscle mass, so the athlete is going to be stronger, so he can run faster or lift more things. Or stimulants, which is going to increase um, heart rate, so glucose and oxygen can be transported around the body faster than they are at the moment. There are also other drugs that um, increase the number of blood cells or increase the way that certain things in the body works. Now, you need to know the pros and cons. Um, so if we're against this, um, it's going to be unfair on people not taking drugs. There could be serious health risks of taking things like steroids for a long time. Um, and it's unfair if only um, certain athletes can afford to buy these drugs, whereas athletes from poorer countries can't afford to buy these drugs. If we're arguing for performance enhancing drugs, we can say that people, um, athletes have the right to make their own decisions about what they do with their life. Um, that drug-free sports um, isn't really um, isn't really fair because um, there's no level playing field in sports anyway. That athletes have different access to different facilities, 
Um, so there's no level playing field at the start, so why shouldn't we just use drugs to make the playing field even more uneven? Um, and those are the ones you need to know. That could come up as a really nice six mark question. Recreational drugs can be illegal or legal ones. So illegal ones, we're talking um, cannabis or ecstasy. Um, now the problem with these is that you're generally buying them from somebody that you don't know, don't necessarily trust. You have absolutely no idea what is in them. Um, so while they say it might be one thing, you could be paying for and taking absolutely anything. So not only is the heroin or cannabis going to have a devastating effect on your body, all the other rubbish that it is mixed with could also have a horrible, horrible, devastating effect on your body. Legal drugs are going to be things like um, nicotine and alcohol, which while they're legal does not mean they are safe. Um, loads and loads of people die each year from nicotine use and um, alcohol use, um, so just because they're legal doesn't mean they're safe. Any medicinal drug that makes it onto the market has to be tested. Um, there is a very, very rigorous uh, round of testing that they need to go through, starting with um, cells and tissues in the lab to see how these um, are affected. We can then move on to testing on animals to see how it works, to see um, what the toxicity is, to see what the dosage is. And then once it passes that, we can move on to doing clinical trials where it's tested on human volunteers. Now, there are lots of controversy involved in every single stage of this. Um, I'm just going to talk about um, clinical trials. So if we're talking clinical trials, we have to have a double-blind clinical trial. So the person giving the drug and the person taking the drug doesn't know whether they're taking an active form of the drug or whether they're taking the placebo. Um, a placebo is going to be like a sugar tablet just to see... Um, whether the act of taking the drug just makes you feel better anyway, whether the drug actually does anything or whether just taking medicine will make you feel better. Um, now the problem with clinical trials um, is that you are taking an unknown drug. Um, you've got no idea what, what it's going to do and there's a story in the news a few years ago where unfortunately um, a large number of people died or became very, very ill when taking a drug. So um, just because you are taking a drug um, in a clinical trial doesn't mean it's not going to kill you. Um, people are generally paid for participating in clinical trials. Um, so... It's, you know, not necessarily always representative of society, but they do try to match up um, sexes, ages and health uh, lifestyles of people. Now, drug testing is really, really important. There was a case in the 1950s of thalidomide where people um, took, uh, pregnant women took thalidomide um, when it hadn't been properly tested in preg for use in pregnancy. And as a result of that, about 10,000 babies um, were born with abnormal limb development and only half of them actually survived. So what can be seemingly a safe drug to take um, if, you're, if you're a man, if you're never going to get pregnant, can actually have some devastating consequences in situations you hadn't thought about. Well done for making it to the end of the video, that was quite a long one there. Good luck for your exams, if there's anything I can do to help just let me know.